Well, good morning. Welcome to the Walden Community Church YouTube channel. My name is David Kinney and I am the pastor here. We are continuing in our series entitled Made Complete. And we are looking at how to be complete, how to feel restored, how to feel uh, made new amidst uh, trying circumstances, trials, grief, sorrow. And uh, we just felt like it was a time where not only is the world going through something pretty spectacular, but even in our own personal lives, we are each walking through uh, something. And so we thought that really wholeness was needed right now. Healing was needed right now. The Bible talks about us being made complete. And so how do we get to those points when it seems like we are walking through a time of difficulty. Today's passage is from 1 Thessalonians 4.13. It says, But we do not want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Paul says a couple of interesting things here, and I wanted to touch on them, because you know during this pandemic, there are those of us who are experiencing well, the same things that everybody else is, right? There's boredom, there's financial pressures, but others of us are experiencing even extra things, more compounded pressures, things like loss, things like death. And Paul is speaking to those people who are walking through or trying to recover from a major loss like this, people who are going through grief. And the first thing he says is, Grief is natural, right? He says that grief is natural. Does he say that? I mean, yeah, I think so. He says, don't grieve as a non-believer, right? He says, don't grieve as the world grieves, implying that, yes, we do grieve also, but we just grieve differently. Paul says, you're allowed to. You're allowed to grieve. Just, he says, not like the world. Last week I said, as a culture, we need to learn to deal with our trials in a healthier way um, and a better way. And I, I think I wanna make the same argument today for grief. Because when we face loss, it's traumatic. And, and we want to run away from it. And we do that because there's something in our minds that says we may not recover. I mean, we've heard it said that Time heals all wounds, right? And while that might be true, it, it doesn't cover the scars. It, 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 we might not feel the immediate sting of grief anymore, but the marks are still there. They don't go away. What we need to do is we need to learn to deal with our grief. And we need to learn to process it in a healthy way. Why? Well, because loss and grief are a reality, they are part of our world. We can't control everything, can we? We can't stop pain, we can't stop loss, and we can't stop death from happening. Jesus says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. And he says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So Jesus says, yes, there's going to be hard times. There's going to be bad times. They're going to happen to everybody. Nobody escapes them. Because typically what happens is either we leave or they leave. And people in our life get sick or they get cancer or they just grow older and we pray for their healing. We do, but we all know how we define healing and how God defines healing can be very different. I know we're going through different things. We're all going through different things. I know what some of you are going through. You're going through the loss of a job, going through divorce, the loss of a child, the death of your parents, the death of a spouse, and still others of you have experienced loss in much different ways. You could have lost your childhood. You know, you were, you were just forced to grow up too fast. You lost your innocence. Or you are losing your health. Some of you have lost the ability to have a child. 
Jesus says, in the world, you will have tribulation, right? He says, you will have trials. And Jesus should know what he's talking about because Jesus also experiences grief. We see in the Bible that Jesus grieved over his friend Lazarus who died in John 11. The Bible says that Jesus wept, right? He cried real tears. The Bible also says that when Jesus stood and looked out over the city, that Jesus cried for a city. He cried for Jerusalem. Luke 13 says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, the truth is, we all have hidden pain. And oftentimes what happens is we shrug it off. We put on a very brave face and we only cry in private. And maybe we'll say things when we're out in public. We'll say, you know, I'm okay. I'm okay. I, I'm getting through this, you know, just taking it one day at a time. But on the inside, we're destroyed. And, and we assure our friends. We say, I'm okay. I'm okay. But we're not. And the Bible never says to do this. The Bible never says, suck it up, <laughs> right? The Bible never says, just move on. The Bible doesn't say, pretend it doesn't hurt. And, and it doesn't say, well, you get extra points if you pretend it doesn't bother you. Because it should bother you. And, and if you're not processing your grief well, you will need help with it. And if our friends are not moving through grief well, we need to help them. We don't want to be people who stay stuck in grief. People who are going through this, our friends, they are going through this, they are being brave, but loss and grief doesn't work best behind closed doors. Loss can lead to isolation, advanced depression, addictions, compulsive behaviors, all because we have not learned to rebuild our lives in a healthy way. We have not learned to recover. We have not learned to rebuild. James says in chapter one, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. James says that trials come in all shapes and sizes. But he says, part of the journey is making our way towards being complete again. Because you see with loss, it's called loss because we lose something. And so what we want is we wanna get more from it than it takes from us. Because oftentimes the more devastating the loss, the harder it is to recover. But we need to learn. We need to learn how to get to a place where we can heal, where we can grow again. And James says it's possible, right? He says it's possible to recover. He says it's possible to feel complete again. Last week, when we talked about trials, I said, we need to learn that when trials come, we need to lean into them, not run away from them. And today I'm gonna to say the same thing with grief. We need to not stay stuck there. We need to not stay stuck in one of the phases of grief, but instead go all the way through it to the other side. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross first identified the five stages of grief in her groundbreaking book, On Death and Dying, back in 1969. And of course, there can be more than five stages, there can be less than five stages, but what she found is typically they happen in this order. And she said the first one, the first stage is denial, right? It's the first response, it's our natural response. We don't want to face it, we don't want it to be true, we don't want to believe it. And so our first response is, I don't believe it. And we've said it. We've said that before. We've said, you're kidding me. I, I just spoke to them yesterday. I just spoke to them last week. They seemed so healthy. 
You know, if it could happen to her, it could happen to anybody. And most of the time, a person's first reaction to a loss is just refusal. A refusal to believe that this is actually happening. That's natural. I think God designed us that way to buffer that first shock of pain. As we start to recover, denial is that just stunness, right? It's being shocked. C.S. Lewis said, no one ever told me that grief felt so much like fear. And the danger is if we get stuck here, stuck in denial, then we will never move past it to face reality. We can't bury it. We can't bury the truth. If you bury something toxic in the ground, time won't heal it. Instead, that toxicity will leak out into the earth and make other things around it sick. We, we can't bury waste. It doesn't just go away. It, it erodes and it kills the soil and it kills the plants. We need to dig that thing up. We need to dig it up and we need to handle it carefully. We can get stuck in denial, even in loss. Things like divorce. You know, people don't want to admit that it's time to move on or that that relationship is over. And they want to bury that pain and they just throw another relationship on top of it. And they just say, you know what, see, I'm not hurt. You didn't hurt me. There's other fish in the sea. In fact, I'm gonna hurt you. I'm gonna make you jealous. You're gonna wish that you never left me. People don't like to admit the loss that separation brings. People don't like to admit the loss that death brings. What happened when your dog died? when you were young, when you were growing up. Your parents thought they could just cover over that grief by what? Getting you another dog, right? Did that work? Of course not. Because that's not how love works. That's not how healing works. I don't want a new dog. I want my dog. I want my friend. We need to learn to deal with sorrow, to admit that it's actually happening to us. Admit the loss and admit that loss hurts. The second phase is anger. The second stage is anger. Anger is also natural. And, and everyone processes their anger differently. But God's word gives us some instruction concerning our anger. If we feel that loss and then we sit in it, oftentimes, it can root up anger. If you had prayed, maybe, that God would heal, and instead, God didn't heal. He withheld his hand. Someone got sicker. Someone died. We can get mad. We'll get mad at God. How come God answers somebody else's prayer, doesn't answer my prayer? How come God did that healing over there? How come they recovered and I didn't? Why, why do some women have a husband lay into their 90s and I, I lost mine? You know, what did I do? What did I do, God? Life isn't fair. Life doesn't feel fair. Or maybe you're at the funeral. You're at the funeral, you see friends, you see family, they attend and you think, where were you? Oh, now you show up to the funeral. Where were you when he was still alive? How, how come you never came by? How come you never called? And we might feel guilty when we feel this way. We might feel guilty that we have these feelings, but we can take some comfort in knowing that Jesus felt angry sometimes. Jesus saw the retail shops who set up in the synagogue, and he knew they're not there trying to help anyone worship. Rather, they're there so they can turn a, a hefty profit for themselves. And the Bible says that he got angry, that he made a whip and he drove them out. Ephesians 4.26 says, be angry and do not sin. God's word doesn't tell us not to be angry. It just tells us not to sin when we're angry. So we need to learn to process our anger. 
and to deal with it in a healthy way, in an honest way. Anger can be a positive and useful emotion. It can be very cathartic if you express it appropriately. But anger, again, is not a good place to get stuck. People who stay in this phase too long, they run the risk of experiencing increased anxiety. People with high blood pressure, with headaches, long-term uh, resolutions for dealing with anger would be get, get out, get, get more exercise, uh, learn some relaxation techniques. Maybe think about signing up for counseling. One of the best things we can do if we see our friend going through this is just to sit with them. You know, when, when we're angry, we might need somebody to hold our clenched fist. We might just need more friends in our life, people that we can be honest with. Hey, how are you doing? I'm feeling angry and being honest. Can you keep me in your prayers? Can you sit with me? Don't ever feel guilty for feeling angry. It's a natural part of grief. It is a natural part of feeling loss. But if you can move from anger, the third stage is bargaining. Bargaining. There was a BBC television show. There was a stage play. There was even a, a movie in the theater with Anthony Hopkins called Shadowlands. Shadowlands is the story of C.S. Lewis. And particularly, it was his time with his wife, uh, Helen Joy Davidman. The, the two of them were married for like four years. That was it. And, and when Helen died of melastatic carcinoma, C.S. Lewis fell into this just immense period of grief and anger and bargaining with God. He, he felt so distant from God and so heartbroken that there were often times that he was even questioning his faith. And he writes all of these feelings down in a book. It's called A Grief Observed. And on one of those pages, he writes, We were promised sufferings. They were part of the program. We were even told, blessed are they that mourn. And I accept it. I've got nothing that I hadn't bargained for. Of course, it is different when the thing happens to oneself and not to others, and in reality, and not in imagination. We plan life to go a certain way. We've got a picture in our minds about how it's supposed to go, and it doesn't always go like that. We think, well, those kind of things, they only happen to other people, and they don't happen to us. And then when they do happen to us, and it's our turn to experience loss, and it's our turn to experience grief, we want to run away from it because we're afraid that we won't recover. There's a part of us that looks back even and maybe questions and says, why did this have to happen? Maybe if I had chosen something different, maybe if I had done something different, maybe I could go back and do it different and I could change the past. And we make a bargain with our past or we make a bargain with our future. And we try to bargain with God. We say, I, you know, obviously this is something I did. So I'll change. God, I'll be different. I promise. I'll be different and I'll get better. And once I get better, you'll reward me with my old life back. We might not even say those words out loud. Maybe it's only a daydream that we think about. We'll close our eyes and we'll imagine if only we had done it differently. And we'll bargain with our past or our future. If it was divorce and somebody left us, we might bargain there too and we'll say, you know, I'll just get my act together. I'll get my act together and my spouse will come back to me. You know, my father left me, but if I could just be the son that he wants me to be, he'll come back. Those stages, they're these last ditch efforts to try to fix something, to do something. We think that we can change our reality 
by our own will. And we think that if I can just hold on to that a little longer, maybe I can fix it. If I just deny that it exists, if I just hold on to my anger a little longer, if I just make a deal that God agrees with, I can go back and I can get my life back. But then after the doubt has cleared and after the anger has settled, and then we realize that we can't bargain and we can't negotiate our way out, we'll settle into the fourth stage and that's sadness and depression. When the loss sets in, depression follows. We're too tired to fight anymore. I mean, what was the good of fighting anyway? All that effort, all those wheels spinning, nothing happened. We become numb to everything. We lose interest in everything. Even little tiny things, movements, thoughts are huge and simple tasks become hard and we sink further down into grief. And the Bible says it's okay to be sad. In fact, Ecclesiastes 3, 4 says, there is a time to weep. Grief is the loss of something. And it's the pain we feel when that something or that someone has left us. And we can feel sad knowing that it will never come back. C.S. Lewis said, the death of a beloved is an amputation. That part of me, the part of me that I've always known, always felt, always loved, is gone. It's an abandonment. Even from the cross, Jesus cries out in sadness. He feels the loss of God and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And all of these stages, the hardest one to hide is depression. Because depression literally happens on your face, right? You can't hide it. We don't, we don't wear anything that covers our face. Our, our face leaks. Our eyes shed tears. Water comes down our face. We wear sadness on our face. What do you do? What do you do when you just suddenly burst out into tears? What do you do when you see somebody else next to you and they start crying? Because I get it. We feel helpless. We don't know what to say. We don't know what to do. We can't fix it. We're not God. We can't take their pain away, but the good news is you don't have to. We think we have to do the right thing and we don't. We think we have to say the right thing and we don't. In fact, Ecclesiastes 7 says, sorrow is better than laughter. For by sadness of face, the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of the morning. And then Romans 12, 15 gives us some great advice about sharing and caring for the other person. It says, mourn with those who mourn. When the great Jewish leader Moses died, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 34, the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days. As a community, shared grief together, the church, the people of God, the synagogue, holding each other as they walk through this together. The bottom line is we get through grief better with others, with community, sharing life, doing life together. Many of us need help moving through the stages of grief. The Bible says mourn with those who mourn. Because what happens when people experience grief? What happens? They pull away, right? They isolate. So even before they take any action, our first step is to reach out. Our first step should be to reach out. You reach out, you invade their life. It could be a phone call, it could be a text, it could be you knocking on their door, or leaving something on their doorstep. And, and, and you are giving them the message, I care. I care. I know it feels like the world has left you. 
I know it feels like your life is broken. I know it feels like you've been abandoned. I know it feels like amputation, but, but God is there. I am there. Remind those around you that you are present and that you care. Your involvement and your words are going to mean so much to them. And if you have to say something else, if you have to offer more words, then, then the words you should offer are, are, what can I do? How can I help you? What do you need from me? What can I do for you? Ask how you can help. And if it's you, if it's happening to you, and nobody is offering, nobody is stepping forward, nobody is coming up to you to ask, stop putting on a brave face. Stop being brave. Wear your emotions on your face. Be honest with people when they ask you how it's going. Tell them, admit, admit that you're stuck in one of the stages. Admit that you're angry. Admit that you're sad. Admit that you need help. Hebrews 4.16 says, let us boldly come before the throne of grace. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 1 Peter 5.6-7 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. We want to get to that last stage that last stage of acceptance. Now, does acceptance mean all the pain is gone? No. Does it mean you have completely forgotten and moved on? No. All it means is that you are living in the new normal. You've heard that phrase a lot, haven't we? Recently, especially with this pandemic, how we're all gonna have to live in the new normal. I was telling my wife the other day, I, I still feel weird at airports. There's this reminder in my head that this is not how it always was. And I still feel like I'm living in a shadow of 9-11. You know what? She disagreed with me. She said it doesn't feel like that to her anymore. She said she doesn't feel the loss anymore. It doesn't hinder her. In fact, she said those reminders actually make her feel safer when she's in the airport. This means that she has adjusted. She has adjusted. She is healthy. She has accepted the past and she is now living in the new normal. And the Bible says this is how it should be. Psalm 30 verse 5 says, Weeping may tarry for the night but joy comes with the morning. Eventually, grief turns into hope again. You know, we go through it. We go through it. We don't stay stuck in it. We come out the other side and then we are new again. And we have a greater appreciation for life again. We don't forget the past. No, we don't forget the past, but we don't stay stuck back there. C.S. Lewis wrote a poem to have placed on his wife's gravestone. It says, Here the whole world, stars, water, air, and field, and forest, as they were reflected in a single mind, like cast-off clothes was left behind, in ashes yet with hopes that she Reborn from holy poverty and Lenten lands hereafter may resume them on her Easter day. Jesus promises that that is the goal for every one of us, that we all get to that same place, a place where there is healing, a place where there is completeness, and as Revelation says, a place where there is no more sadness and no more tears. Chapter 21, verse 4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, 
and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Listen, I know it's tough. It's tough even when there is an end in sight. We all feel loss. We have all felt loss. And there are those of us who even right now know that there is even more loss ahead of us. There is more grief ahead of us. Don't run away from it. Don't ignore it. And don't go through it alone. Don't let those you know go through it alone. Help those you love find health. Help those you love find completeness. Every day is going to be another opportunity for hope and healing. And hopefully, we'll all be living in the new normal. Let's pray. Dear Lord, with all the joy that you have given us, with all the blessings, with all the good things of life that make us smile, we also live in a world of grief and sadness and sorrow, and it is the balance of life. It is the reality of life. As much as we have peaks in our life, there are also valleys. As much as there is blessing in our life, there is also scarcity. Lord, we just ask that even though these times are scary and we are fearful of them, that we don't run away from them. Help us to transition through them safely. Help us to spend the right amount of time in each phase healthily. And may we walk through it with our church. May we go through it with our church members. May we go through it with our friends and our family and our loved ones. May we help hold their hands just as they help hold ours. And we're not through it yet. We're not out of it yet. There is more to come. And as scary as it is, as dark as it might be, as nervous as it might make us, Lord, we just pray that you give us courage because we know there's health and wholeness and completeness on the other side. We thank you for your son and for his life as a model. He showed us the way. He showed us how to live. We thank you for his example. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for tuning in this morning. Of course, you can share this file. Uh, these YouTube links, they're here. They stay here. Please, after you watch this, if you feel blessed by it, you can copy uh, the location of it. You can post it to your own social media walls, or you can post it to the wall of a friend or family member who you think might be blessed by it. We can use these times together as a way to uh, not only tell people about our church, but tell other people about the greatness of our God. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week. I'll see you guys soon. Bye.